Hello and welcome to In the Court of the Winter. Nay, we're doing all of King Crimson, all of King Crimson here, all the CDs, sort of, anyway. Um, today we're doing Live at the Marquee, we're back to the Marquee once again. Um, we're really into uh, probably the trickiest part of this, this review series, really, where I've got to do all of these King Crimson Mark II uh, live albums, which are almost the same. <laughs> but we'll get through it. Episode 22 will be Locks, Tongues in Aspic. So yeah, we're back at the Marquee. We've been to the Marquee before, in 1969, for, for, for a, a quite poor sounding audience recording. Brilliantly, this is a proper recording, and brilliantly the sound is excellent. So not like the horrible earthbound sound, this has really got really good sound, really good performance. Uh, they put pictures of the city now sensibly at the start, so the set list makes sense. Um, they were playing halls at this point, they weren't playing clubs. The, the Marquee was, was a thank you to fans, and I believe it was three nights I think this is the second night, maybe. Um, suppose it's some at some point John Mayle and Pete Green were in the audience, who I think were both past it at this point. I, I don't know, but particularly Pete Green may have already sort of gone into the pit of despair at that point. Not entirely sure. It's interesting how after only twenty gigs, things are already starting to form. So you know, I think that the last week the Plymouth gig was their fifth gig, which they previously played the Zoom Club. And we're halfway towards them being their own band, what the band became, I think, at this point. Um, there's lots of clarity in the playing, and obviously a lot of, a lot of that's to do with the sound quality as well, and it's very clear, which is wonderful. Where this came from, who knows? This was the penultimate Collectors Club CD, so apart from the Argentina DVD, that, that was it. That was the last one. So they, they saved it as, a, as, a, as an awesome one, or it didn't turn up, maybe, I don't know. The, uh, the Atari VCS, as I call it, it's still in force, not as obnoxious as it was right near the start. He's obviously got a bit more tasteful with it. I'm still not a fan of it. Obviously, the whole point is experimenting with new technology, etc. More significant than anything else, though, is track one of disc two, because this is this is a, di a two disc performance, so it's quite long. Um, it's a near half an hour improv. This is improv, only of course it isn't. It isn't an improv at all. They're fooling us. It's Lark's Tongues Part 1, or an early version of Lark's Tongues Part 1. Different arrangement, obviously. This is before they've recorded the album, remember? They haven't recorded the album yet. So, it wasn't on Islands. Apparently it was recorded for Islands. It's on the, the, the Masters for Islands has a, this version of, of Lark's on it, so that's, that's fascinating. It's a huge thing. Uh, so we'll go straight into the songs. Uh, Pictures of the City is the first track. It's very quickly forming into their own version, and, and their own approach to these things is much more driving, partially to do with the, the, the heavy, simple bass, which people criticise, because because they know the story of, of him learning bass in rehearsals at the start. Um, they think it's because it's dumb, but actually what it's, it's, a, it's a style, and it makes it this sort of driving hammer of a riff that makes it just really heavy. Track two, Formentera Lady. Uh, there's harmonies on here from the band, which didn't end up on the album. Obviously they've got female singer and stuff on the album. Then we've got Sailor's Tale. Now, by this time, it's pretty much like the album version, pretty much, from what I can hear. Whereas the, the version on Plymouth was substantially different. Track 4, Circus. Heavy. Oh! Uh, the Mellotron's, Mellotron's a bit loud, unfortunately. You can't, the drums are a bit low. So there's a bit of a mix issue going on. This, this must be a soundboard, I'm assuming. I don't know where it came from. Um, I don't know if that was, the, that, that was just the live mix from Bitter Sinfield. As always, Mel Collins is, is fantastic on that track. They didn't carry very much across that wasn't played by the 69 band, but there was a reason they did with that. It worked so well live. Much better than the album version. Uh, then we got the letters. Uh, better version than the previous version. I'm not a massive fan of it. Um, track 6 is Cadence and Cascade. Another nice version of Cadence and Cascade. You can't have too many versions of that. Then we have disc 2. Track 1 is listed as Improv. However, if you put it into iTunes, it's listed as Lark's Improv. It's Lark's Part 1. It's an earlier version of Lark's Part 1. It's not an improvisation using some of the themes. It's an early version of Lark's Tom's Part 1. Didn't have the title, obviously, because that was Jamie Mew's title. But Fripp does a, an announcement and he says this will be on the next album. So at this point, it was going to be on the next album. So the question is, why did they not put it on the next album? And you know, I mean, Fripp himself says, well, would that band have been able to play Lark's Tom's Part 1 the way he was hearing it? And he says, no. That doesn't mean... Only the mighty Bruford and Wetton can play such difficult music. 
they can play, of course they can play, they play really well, but it's it's different. It just comes out as a different style and it's jazzy and it's Americanized. It doesn't have the Europeanness, even though the the guitar and the, the, the notes are extremely modern classical European kind of stuff. You give it to that band, they take it in a jazzier direction. They're not the right band to play Euro rock, that's the point. Doesn't mean they're not fantastic. Interestingly at the start, Fripp actually mentions what the song's about. So here we have a literal interpretation of Lark Songs in Ashby, uh, which we don't get right till Lark Songs Part 4, obviously I'm not going to talk about that yet. He says it's a reaction to all the big cities. Um, he lists like New York and things like that, and it's a reaction to Wigan. So there's obviously an in-joke there or something, because you don't think of Wigan as this sprawling metropolis of concrete. It's just Wigan, isn't it? Uh, but yeah, it's nearly 30 minutes. It's really jazzy. There's an edit at the start, unfortunately. I think it just cuts in. I think. It doesn't sound like the real start. Uh, there's some cool sections not included, obviously, on the final locks. One. Uh, more suited to s s saxisms, saxophone which are really cool little little bits, so you know. Th this is a must purely for that track. I mean, it is fascinating and it's really good as well. If you want to hear what would that band sound like doing Knox, there it is. I assume this is on the island's uh, 40th anniversary, which I haven't got yet. Uh, then we have Ladies of the Road. Now, by this point, the arrangement is sorted out and it is now arranged like the album version, but it's more kind of slinky. So whereas in Plymouth they were just belting it out right from the very start with Boz going on full bore on his voice. This is this is continuously slinky and it has a slightly different feel. It's not as noisy as the album version in a way. Track 3 of disc 2 is a band announcement. For it pronounces the band, not much to say about that one. And track 4 is his schizoid band. It's still not their version yet. It's moved in that direction but it isn't there yet. So you, although the, these recordings are of really nice quality this isn't this band's version of Schizoid Man yet. That's still to come. But don't worry, we've got plenty of those to come. It's always Ace, though, obviously, and they, they, they never did a bad version of it. And I think I think Mel Collins perhaps was more suited to playing that song solos than, than Ian MacDonald. Controversial. See you next week for Brighton 71. <laughs>